the first day that we got into the mission field, I entered the, uh, the mission Peru Lima East, uh, started there. We, um, we got onto a bus that was just right outside the MTC. It drove for like two minutes and stopped in front of this house. <laughs> we, we had the great joy of the fact that the MTC was actually in our mission. <laughs> so it, this huge bus drives, stops right in front of this house, and we all get out and we're just staring at this house like, what, what's going on here? You know, we've got the new mission president, President Ardila, standing there. He's from Colombia, didn't speak much English, <laughs> but excited, happy, you know. And as we're standing here in front of this house, this garage door just opens, and inside are all the trainers and all the office wearing weird hats, all this stuff, uh, just like start blowing off whistleblowers and all these noisemakers with this huge sign that says, Welcome to the mission. And it was just like, This is so cool. <laughs> Um, so we started there. We had our during that whole day. We had um, what do we call it? The it wasn't really a conference, but it was the welcome to the new missionaries. A bit of an explanation of the things that we were going to be experiencing while we were there. Um, for those of us who didn't speak Spanish very well, some of the office members came and sat by us and tried to explain what the president was saying and all this stuff. Um, so I remember a couple of particular things. The first one was the, the awesome feeling when I met my first companion, my trainer. His name was Elder Conde. He's a short guy from Peru, from Arequipa, which is a funny story about that, but I could explain that later. He, just, he was this really happy guy, you know, and he, he was excited to meet me, and he was telling me about how awesome this was going to be, and it just got me excited. I was just like, yes! And then they started speaking in Spanish. <laughs> And I remember the president speaking in Spanish, and I'm kind of sitting there trying even harder to figure out what he's saying. You know, I, I just left the MTC. I had just learned how to at least understand mostly what Spanish speakers were saying, how to communicate, maybe not effectively, but communicate at least. And we get here, and he starts using all these big words and just really fast, and you're just like, I know nothing again. I know nothing again. <laughs> but it was, a good, again, another good feeling because then you wanted to keep learning more after that. Um, I remember in particular my interview with him on the first day, and we're sitting there, and he, he sits down, and I sit down too, and he goes, um, Elder Cody, uh, how are you? And I go, I'm good, I'm good, bien, bien. And he goes, uh, how, uh, what, what goals do you have? What, what goals do you have? And I go, well, I have this goal, and he suddenly goes, Elder, por favor, usted está hablando español en esta misión, necesitas hablar en el idioma de tu misión. What? <laughs> uh, you need to speak Spanish. Spanish is your mission language. Speak with me in Spanish. Uh, okay. Uh, bien. <laughs> The whole interview just kind of went with like that, just me trying to speak this terribly broken Spanish, and him kind of go like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but you can see that he, he understood, you know, because I'm sure he had many North Americans who couldn't speak Spanish talk, trying to talk with him. Um, but it, even bes besides that, though, like even though there was that hard communication for me at that moment and for him because, you know, he's learning English himself, it, it was still a really cool interview because it was that first moment where it's like, this is real. I'm going out. I'm doing stuff. This is my mission president. He's, he's in charge of me. He's probably going to be watching over me and about 200 other people. <laughs> this is real. This is awesome. And that same night, uh, because my first area was in Lima, me and my companion, we left a lot of the other guys who were going out to the, the further areas of what we call province. And that was going out to Huancayo, to Huanaco, the places that later became the new mission, Huancayo. Um, they stayed at the mission home that night. We just went to our apartment. And that, I believe, was kind of the most real feeling of like, this is really happening. I am, I am a missionary. I'm done with my training. I'm out of the MTC. No more, no more big walls surrounding us. We're, we're going to go out. We're going to do things. And it was, it was both scary and yet also exciting. And getting to the room and just kind of 
collapsing on the bed. <laughs> and then that first week was probably the scariest thing I've ever done because as I'm going out, I'm ha my companion, he doesn't speak English either, honestly. Um, so he's trying to, we're trying to communicate. We, we started learning. We got better as we went along there. That first week was the hardest though, just because we did have so much communication barriers. And then because I also had communication barriers with the people who we were teaching. And when he would take me out, uh, when we left the apartment after studies and we started doing all that stuff and proselyting, it was hard. It was, it was kind of like this, there's the food's new, the people are new. I don't know how to talk to them. And about the only thing I could do was when my companion looked at me like your turn and I would just be like, ah, uh, uh, es verdad. It's true. It's true. What my companion has said is true. I mean, and I didn't even know what he said some of the times. He probably could have said, and my companion here is a moron, and he really, really smells bad. And I would have just been saying, it's true. I, I testify, it is true, whatever he said. <laughs> um, but what was really cool about that was even doing just that, even just trying to say something, you could still see the effect that it would have on people. There were still people there who were just kind of like, like, could feel like, yes, uh, okay, yeah, that is true. You know, and when you tried... When I tried to share my testimony, which didn't happen too often because I did, I was still kind of awkward and not sure what to say. But when I did try to share something as far as testimony goes and you could feel the spirit there, it didn't really even matter that my Spanish was broken and bad. But you could still see the, the effect that that had on them and that it was just that cool feeling of joy and just that they, they could feel it. I mean, I don't know if, if they really wanted to follow it or if they understood what it was, but you could see it and you could feel it too. So that was a cool moment. Well, the Peru on Cayo mission is, it's kind of like the central Peru mission. It extends from a place in the south called Huancavelica up to a place in the north called Huanuco, and even then a little bit further north than that, a little town called Pingo Maria. Um, it's a fairly new mission. It opened in 2013, in July of 2013. The current mission president has been the only mission president in said mission. And honestly, it's it's a really cool mission. Um, as far as places or things that you would see within that mission, the mission has mostly mountainous regions, so you'll mostly be up in al uh, altitude areas, but it's also got a couple of places where you would have to go into the jungle. For example, uh, there's a place called La Merced where I actually got to serve for six weeks, and it's just jungle. It's just, it's not like deep jungle. But you still wake up every morning, it's hot, it's humid, and you kind of look outside and you just see trees and green everywhere and you're just like, I cannot believe that there is a place on earth that looks like this. This is beautiful. Um, there's also, for example, the exact opposite. There's a place called La Oroya, which was once the most polluted city on earth. It was, it's a mining town and it is, I will, I will admit it is very ugly. <laughs> there's a lot of good people there. There's a lot of, there's, a, I don't know if there's a ton of members there, but I know that they've got a good ward and a, or branch going there. I think it's a ward actually. I'm not sure. I didn't actually get the opportunity to serve there, but the surrounding countryside is just, it's kind of bleached and dead looking. It's recently, since they put a lot of more uh, regulations in place, it started growing back up, but it's not too bad. Uh, one of the most interesting places for me in that mission is a place called Cerro de Pasco. It's a city that is 14,210 feet above sea level. So really high altitude. Uh, a lot of missionaries, when they first get there, they, they actually need to get the oxygen out and put the oxygen on them as soon as they get there, which the, the zone leaders facilitate that. Um, on the other hand, there are a few who, who surprise you and they don't even need that. You kind of just look at them and go, how, how? How? <laughs> but they, they call it, they call it the highest city on earth. It's not actually the highest city on earth, but it is the highest city with a population of over 50,000 people. So surprisingly big. It's a mining town. And, uh, I got to serve there for three transfers and one, eight, one of those was an eight week transfer because of some changes that were going on with the mission. And I will say it was cold. It was very cold, but it's also one of the only places in the mission that you might actually see snow. So it's kind of fun too that way. Um, places like Wanuko, that's a little lower altitude. It's still technically in the mountains, but it feels more temperate. Uh, the only problem with Wanuko, as far as I'm concerned, is the w wind at the midday. The rest of the time, it's just nice and warm during the day, cools off at night. It's a really nice place to serve. Then, of course, you've got Wankayo itself. That's the where we've actually got the mission home. That's where everything's set up from. And Wankayo is a really cool city. It's like this, it's growing. Um, 
just nice city. A lot of nice members there, honestly. They've got two stakes in Wankayo itself. And some of the coolest members of the church that I have met in Peru were I met in Wankayo because they're just, a lot of them are really faithful there. A lot of them really want to help. And it's just, it's kind of a cool, positive experience to work there. Um, you may still have to work with some members because you would still have people who might not be quite as uh, specific towards what you, you need as a missionary or what your investigators might need. But if you ask, a lot of them will be willing to actually help. You've just got to take that step too to go out there and do it with them. So Wankayo is honestly a really cool place. Um, in the mission, of course, we speak Spanish. Lots of Spanish because it is Spanish. <laughs> Uh, but there's a place towards the south. You'll, you'll start seeing it like in Wankayo and places like that. They speak a language called Quechua. And Quechua is confusing. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a fun language to learn. If you dedicate yourself to it, you can probably get several, a lot of cool things out of it and figure out more or less how to, how to do it. I didn't really get the chance because I didn't really go further south of Wankayo towards Wankavalik and those areas where they speak it a lot. But if you go to that mission, you will find places where you might actually have to start speaking Quechua and start learning it a little bit, especially if you head to Huancavelica. Huancavelica uh, is kind of interesting because it's like two wards out there, or two branches. Yeah, two branches right now. The Huancavelica branch and the Lear Kyle branch, and they're not actually associated with any stake. They're just their own separate units down there. Uh, they used to be attached to the Huancayo stakes, but then they, they split them off. Um, yeah, so there, that's kind of an interesting area down there. It's about four hours away from Wankayo, and I've heard horror stories about the bus ride. Uh, but, but I'm sure it's fine. I'm sure it's fine. If the guy gets going ridiculously fast, just hold on. <laughs> well, as far as the church, uh, let me see about the stakes right now. In Wanaco, in the north part of the mission, there are two stakes. There's the Wanaco stake and the Amarillo stake. I got to serve in the Wanaco stake. It's wonderful, just great. That area is probably growing probably the fastest of any of the areas in the mission. It's because Wanca or Wanaco is actually kind of a smaller city. It's really not that big kind of just concentrated, but it has enough members there that they've actually got two stakes there, which is something kind of surprising. Whereas if you go to Wankaya, which is significantly bigger than Wanako, and they've also got just two stakes, and you kind of go, oh, well, okay, that's interesting. So you go to Wanako, and you will find a lot of members there, a lot of people who want to help, a lot of people who are willing to do stuff. The work is, is really good there. There's, there's one ward in particular. We were a little bit worried about them, but they were, they were baptizing a lot of people, just like lots of people, and it was, it was really cool. We, like I said, we did worry that maybe they weren't doing things exactly correctly in the ward, but not so, I don't think it was really that bad. Like, I don't think they were really doing anything terrible with, or anything like that, as far as I could tell. I talked with the bishop a few times, and he seemed like a actually really decent guy, and he really wanted to focus on the missionary work there. So, um, there is a slight issue with ward boundaries <laughs> in Wanaco if you do go there. Um, just that sometimes they like to go across ward boundaries, and they're not always going to the ward where they should go. But all it really needs is just a little bit of talking, a little bit of gentle nudging, and a lot of times they'll start listening to you and going back. If they don't, you don't get frustrated with that. You just accept that you're not going to be able to make the decisions for them, and then you just keep going, looking to do what you can, and keep going on with the missionary work. And you'll find that a lot of the members there really are wanting to help with that, which is really cool. Um, below the, the two stakes in Monaco, the one... The next one there is a stake in Cerro de Pasco, the, the really high altitude city. That's also a pretty good stake. Missionary work can be a little bit hard there. It has a bit of a reputation. Cold city, cold people. <laughs> but there are really a, quite a few good people there in Cerro de Pasco as well. And as far as I was concerned, in my mission, that was one of my favorite zones to serve in just because it was a zone where you had to learn where you worked, where you wanted to do and you wanted to strive. And it's currently... Um, it's, it is a hard zone. It is known as a hard zone, but it's where the mission president is going to send some of those missionaries that he knows are going to work hard, that are going to do their best for the people there. And if you get sent there, you've got to know that the mission president will have a lot of confidence in you because he knows that you're going to do great things there with a lot of the people there. Uh, next, you have the district of Tarma, which consists of a city called Tarma, consists of La Arroya, and a bunch of little cities that are dotted around. It's kind of a spread out zone. Uh, it is a district, so it is not a full stake. Uh, the work there is also okay. 
Uh, I did not actually get the chance to serve in that district, so I can't really say much about how well things go. But it's, it's from what I've heard, it's also a pretty good place to serve, and you will find quite a bit of success there too. After that, you've got Le Merced, which is a steak, and it's just, it's also a very spread out steak, but it's all in the jungle. The entire thing is in the jungle. And if you go there, you will be serving like a lot further away from your zone leaders, from the other people in your, in, in the steak. And they actually recently divided that into two zones too. It's just one steak, but it's got two zones in it. Um, but it's, it's also a really great place for the missionary work, honestly. You, you may have to animate the members a little bit more if you go there. You may, we had to work a lot with people and try to convince them, like, come help us, come do this. But for the most part, we did have several members who were, who were always willing to come help, who were always willing to do things, you know. And then Wong Kayo, like I said, Wong Kayo's got the two stakes there. A lot of members, a lot of, a lot of people really excited there. Um, they, I will say this about this mission. In Wong Kayo, those people are determined to get a temple in Wong Kayo. That is the one thing that they dream about and the one thing that they're constantly talking about. And since recently they announced uh, they're building a, a temple in Trujillo, and they also announced another one in Arequipa, it's been very exciting because since, until this, that time, the only temple that was serving in Peru was the Lima Temple, which is also in the Lima East Mission, um, which I also served in. But that was the only temple that would service the entire country. And for a long time, that also serviced a lot of people outside of the country before they started getting temples in Ecuador and Chile and places like that in Bolivia. Um, so a lot of the announcements of the new temples in Peru got a lot of people excited. And in Huancayo, there was, uh, there was a general authority who visited there one time, a long time before they opened up the missions and started a lot of the changes that we see. And he announced, when he saw Wankayo, he said, this is a place where you will see a st many stakes of Zion, you will see a mission here, and you will see a temple here. And when they opened up the new mission in Wankayo, a lot of people were, just saw that as a fulfillment of that prophecy of, of that, and now they're looking forward to the temple, and that's what they really want to get. So if you can get members excited about the missionary work, all you have to do is also relate it to the temple and a lot of the temple work, and a lot of them will be just super excited about that. And it's really cool to see just how, how much they want it and how much they want those blessings in Wong Kai of a temple. So that's also a really cool thing to note when you go there. Living in Wong Kai, I, I did spend most of my mission in Wong Kai. Even when I was in Lima East, I was in Wong Kai. <laughs> so living in Wong Kai, Wong Kai is, it's a fairly big city. It's, it's not like Lima, Lima's huge. But it, as far as uh, size goes, it's a decent sized like little city. We'll call it a little city. Um, it's got uh, this place where it kind of naturally splits, where the Rio Montaro kind of just passes between two halves of it. And within that, you've got the, basically the entire valley of what's called Montaro. And that's where Huancayo is situated. So you'll see different sections that are, they're not really Huancayo, Huancayo but we counted them as part of Wonka because honestly, they're just right there. Um, so you've got this natural river, which kind of just runs through it. On one half of the river, you have this place called El Tambo, which is a district, which has some other districts which surround it in provinces. Um, and then on this side of the river, you have the, the district Huancayo and Chilca and some other places that are also surrounding provinces. Towards the middle of this area is a place that's fairly commercial. Um, this is a place where you'll see hotels. They're not huge hotels. Again, this isn't a big city. So, you, you know, don't expect skyscrapers where you're like, whoa. You know, these, this is a poor people. This is not a very big city. So you, you'll probably see maybe seven stories or so, but not, not huge. But in the middle anyways, you, see you have this uh, commercial center. In particular, you've got La Plaza de Armas, which is kind of what I would consider the center of Huancayo, which has the, their traditional Catholic church, like right in the middle of it. It's got the fountain there in that center. And then all around, you've just got shops, just tons of them. You've got clothing shops, you've got uh, toy stores, you've got uh, tourist stuff, basically souvenirs that they want to sell off to tourists or whether they be from out of the country or in the country. If you're from out of the country, by the way, expect to be ripped off. <laughs> They'll just do it naturally. Oh, he's white. I'll charge him three times the price. <laughs> uh, and don't, don't get mad about it. They, they just do it. Just try to haggle it back down to what it should be. So, 
or send your a Latin companion to go buy it for you, even easier. Um, so that's what they've got there. You start getting away from that center area and you'll start seeing smaller buildings and this is more where the people actually live. This is also where they would have their, their own little shops, their own work stuff. Um, in Wonkaiu in particular, as far as jobs go, you know, because outside of the commercial centers, a lot of people there are farmers. To be, to be honest, a lot of them have chakras, is what they call their fields. They, a lot of what they do then there is grow, they'll grow corn, and they'll grow quinoa, and they'll grow things like that. And that's kind of where they focus a lot, is on the production of these things. You'll see people with other, like their own stores and other things which they've been building there. Uh, you'll also see some retired people coming from other places to live there as well, occasionally. But the amount of fields that I actually saw there was just massive, especially as you get outside of the actual city, you'll see more fields, more chakra, more of these places where they're just growing things and where they're trying to do farming. And it's really cool to see that too. Sometimes it gets annoying because when you're trying to meet with people, well, they've gone out to the chakra for the day, you know? Um, and the other thing there that I will mention is that a lot of people don't actually own the fields where they work. They're just hired to go in there and start helping to harvest and to plant and do things like that. So a lot of them are farm help as well as you could say. And then you might have like one guy who's a bit richer, a bit better off, who actually will own all the fields and all the product that's being pulled out of it. Um, so that's, that's where you'll see a lot of people working. But because it is a city, you'll also see people working in like uh, metallurgy. You'll see them doing those kinds of things. You'll see people working as uh, taxi drivers. You'll see people working as all kinds of things there. But if, if I did have to define it as any particular city, I would say an agricultural-based city. Before I get into transportation and safety, though, I do also want to mention this. For whoever's going to be in the mission, um, I do want to mention, again, a little bit of food, just because I like food. Um, if you're going to the mission one Kyle, you won't have to worry about cooking for yourself at all because we in the mission they do what's called the pensions pension program and what that is is the mission will go out they'll find ladies usually sisters of the church who are under like under the correct circumstances they're not single they're not under a certain age um, they don't have single daughters at home especially that single stuff um, and they're, they're within like clean conditions as far as their kitchen goes and a lot of other things like that. They will actually come in and they will hire these ladies to cook the, the meals for the missionaries. And that's just for safety precautions again, because if we had the guy missionaries cooking for themselves, we might not always know exactly what to do. So uh, while, while you can go to the markets, there, uh, do shopping, things like that on your P-Day, um, you could also go to stores. You'll find that there are supermarkets there, like, like what you'd expect here. Um, they would be a little bit more pricey, but you could go to those or you could just go to the random little stores that you find everywhere if you need to buy something. But food won't really need to be something that you need to worry about all the time. Maybe if you just want a snack. Um, but yeah, but if you do need, for example, to get like to go buy uh, shampoo, soaps, whatever, you know, just find one of the stores. In Wonkayo, there are a few supermarkets that you can go check out. Or, like I said, I swear, on every corner, on every street, you'll find someone who's opened up a little store, just a little shop, which they, they'll just have tons of things for sale. A lot of it just depends on how much you want to pay and making sure that the prices are decent. Um, now, as for transportation in Wonkayo, um, Wonkayo's transport usually will involve one of two things. You'll either be running around in taxis, or you'll be in what's called a combi. Uh, and basically the combi is just this big van with a bunch of seats, um, which you, you can just pay like a low flat rate to get on, drive it to a certain place, and then you get off. Usually usually they'll just let you get on and then you pay them. They'll, like They'll start asking for money about halfway through or when you get off, they'll ask you to pay. Um, usually it just costs like one or two souls. Sometimes it might cost three depending on distance and how long you're actually on the comp before. Like, for example, if you're just there for like half a ride, they might just charge you 50 cents uh, each. So you just give them one soul for everybody and you get off. Taxis will be a little bit more expensive, obviously, because you're you're heading more specific. And in when I was there, at least, they started getting a little bit more pricey with a lot of things, food and taxi-wise. Uh, the first time I was in Wonkayo, I could get from one place to another in a taxi just a short distance for like three souls uh, when I came back later that same distance cost me about four souls and then about five the thing about the taxis though is that you can haggle with those guys and try to lower the price which is nice we actually had one cool experience on Christmas 
Christmas is crazy and they will raise all the prices because they will take advantage of that for everything. But you, we were trying to get a taxi on Christmas because we wanted to go sing with um, on Christmas Eve with our zone in the middle of one Kyle. And we, we flagged down like three different taxis and each of them was like, yeah, I'll take you there for seven souls. And we're like, dude, we used to go there for three souls like last week. What are you, what are you doing? This is ridiculous. And most of the guys would go like, ah, no, it's Christmas Eve. You know, we, we've got all this stuff going. I can't, seven souls is pretty good, you know, for, for this evening. I promise you, I'm giving the best rate that I can give you right now. And you're just like, this bull, <laughs> that's just garbage. Get out of here. And so we, we passed like three guys trying to do this. And the last guy we sent off and we were just kind of walking dejectedly thinking, oh, we're going to have to walk the whole way. We're going to get there late. And this guy just randomly pulls up next to us and goes, hey, how much was that guy asking you or asking for? And we go, seven souls. And he goes, well, that's ridiculous. And we go, yeah, right. And he goes, I'll take you there for three. Thank you. <laughs> we, we were seriously very grateful at that moment, I sp to both to the guy, to our Heavenly Father, that we, we would actually be able to go participate in this activity with the rest of our zone, which was a really fun activity, too, because we got to sing some of the, the hymns from the Spanish hymn book. Um, it, was, it was really cool. But that's for me, is also a really good example of just how the transport will work there. You will have to haggle with people. Um, the combis you don't haggle because they're combis and they're just charging so very little you just pay them anyways. And just because they also go on a specific route, you just have to memorize what the routes are and try to get off in the right spot and hope that you grab the right number of combi. Taxis, you haggle. You, there's just no way you're gonna take the straight out rate. I mean, you'd end up pay, using most of your fund for on that and then you'd end up without money to take taxis and you'd have to walk everywhere. You know, which in some parts of Wankaya was doable. We would actually have, I had an area where we did mostly just walk everywhere and we would just use the taxis to go to meetings or if we were, if it was an emergency and we needed to get somewhere quick. But other than that, we just walked too. So you'll find areas where that's a little more normal. With Peruvians, if somebody offers you food in their home, it is really, really hard to say no. Because down there, saying no when somebody offers you food is like one of the most e offensive things you can possibly do. If, if somebody, like, and this it's really sad too, because these families, like a lot of them, they won't have all that much food in the first place. This is a very poor culture as well. You will see, you'll see people well off, you'll see people who are doing well, but you'll also see a lot of poor people, people who are just barely scraping by, who are just barely trying to get through all this stuff. And like, it's, it's just, it's sad. And yet here they are. Uh, they will offer you food. It doesn't matter who you are, what you're doing, you know, as if they're decent people, like whether they're interested in the church or not, whatever, they will always offer you food because that's customary. That's what you do. Um, but as missionaries, of course, we're restricted in what we actually can accept to eat down there because the water is, is really not that clean. The water has a lot of issues. If you're going to be drinking the water, it either needs to have been boiled and prepared in the pension or it needs to have been filtered or just bought in bottles. Because if you're just drinking tap water and things just like that, it can be fairly bad for you. And it can, can cause a lot of problems. And if things aren't cooked properly, which a lot of people down there don't realize that because uh, a lot of us are foreigners and a lot of us are from outside of the country, even if we're just like from nearby countries, going there, eating the food, which can be prepared a bit badly uh, with microorganisms, with spices, with other things that we're not used to, we can get really sick. Which is why it is a rule in the missions down there that you're not supposed to accept food just from anybody or under a lot of circumstances where they cooked it. But for the most part, they won't know that. And they will offer you food. And it is so, so hard to explain to them that I cannot eat your food because they will get offended. They will be sad. And all the, a lot of them will probably just be sitting here thinking, oh, those Mormon missionaries are so rude. They said no to my food. They don't want to eat my food. They must not like me. The uh, jerks. You know, so at culture, that's something that, especially for the missionary work, which you, you will have to note when you go there, is that you have to be careful how you approach that situation because we want to be obedient to the rules, but we don't want to offend them either. And a lot of times you're going to have to make some very hard decisions under that circumstances. There were times when I ate the food, quite frankly, because I really didn't want them to feel bad. And then there were other times where I refused to eat the food, but I tried to explain to them why I couldn't eat the food, but I think they still got offended. And some of them were members who knew better. <laughs> but you will, you will just have to make some decisions in those moments and decide what is going to be better here. And that's kind of a moment when you also have to sit and go, okay, you know, Heavenly Father, do I eat the food? 
should I eat the food or should I be more obedient? And you will have to make that decision yourself to the rule. Um, and I, I won't judge anybody else who eats the food either, because quite frankly, I did it, and it's it's hard to say no. Um, let's see, culturally, other things to note with Peruvians. A lot of them are generally fairly happy people. Um, there's a lot of drinking there, just be warned of that. <laughs> um, trying to think, there's a lot of fun things that they do too. Like they've got a they've got a really rich culture as far as dances and customs go. Uh, and for example, in Huancayo, it's just the Huancayo, which is in the province of Junín itself. You will find tons of different traditional dances that they do. One of the one of the more common, for example, is called Wailash. And that is, that's, it's hard to explain exactly the dance, but the, the ladies have these cool, extremely like detailed, uh, detailed skirts, which they've had all just prepared and everything like that. The guys will have on the vests and they'll just do this really cool dance, which is really, uh, it's, it's, it's cool. It's hard to explain it other than that. Um, I would suggest looking it up on the internet if you want to see a little bit more of it, but that one's a cool tradition, something that I really like. But then they've also got all these other, other like dances and other celebrations, which they'll be doing. Um, I'll give you a really cool example of one in Wanaco. Monaco, just that little city to the north, has this celebration during Christmas. It's based on a Catholic tradition of worshiping the baby Jesus, in which they, they will worship the baby Jesus, so they do it around Christmas. But it's called Los Negritos, the El Baile de los Negritos. It's In English that would be translated the, the black people dance. <laughs> But what it is, is it's actually harkens back to days when Wanaco, with a lot of the mines that were around it, a lot of the uh, lords and ladies of the land, lords and ladies of the land, I say, they, they still deal with a bit of that kind of an idea. But a lot of those those mine owners and the, the owners would bring in slaves, of course, to do a lot of that work for them. So they bring in a lot of people from Africa and from areas like that to start working in these mines. And a lot of times that was very hard for them. I mean, they had the the, the taskmasters in the mines, some of the, the foremen who would be, of course, like with the whips and making sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And according to the tradition, what these slaves then would do, the, the one thing that they could do to help relieve some of that stress to, of being in that slave or being in that situation was they would dance. And what they would do is they would prepare their costumes and they would do it specifically on the, the celebration of the baby Jesus and they would do a dance. Well, that started converting into an actual tradition, which now is just fully present in Wanako today. And what they do is they prepare these like extremely detailed costumes, honestly, and they make these like masks. They've got some black ones for the negritos, the, the slaves. They've got these white bearded ones for the Spanish foreman of the mines. Um, the white bearded guys, there's like two of them within the dance who basically just go around making mischief with noisemakers and cracking little whips and just being silly generally. Um, and then, of course, during the dance, you have the Lord and the Lady, who are the owners of the mine, who would also appear during the dance. Um, you just have a bunch of the negritos. And the, the costumes for this are honestly ridiculously elaborate. And they've, like, they've got this um, thing attached to these huge wide brimmed hats that they're wearing on top of these masks, which just goes up and it's just covered with these different rows of feathers. Like, I swear they just use feather dusters for it, but they can because that's that's kind of the look they're going for. And it just kind of goes up like that. And then they'll do this dance every Christmas. The streets just fill up with guys doing this dance. Guys and girls dressed up in these costumes doing this traditional dance. And during Christmas, it's very hard to get around Wanuko just because everywhere. It's everywhere there. And I almost got to see it in person. Almost, if they hadn't transferred me the week before Christmas to the jungle, which for me was kind of sad because I really did want to see it. But I got to see people start doing it like sporadically around Wanaco because they would just do it also as, as the Christmas season got closer. For me, that was kind of like a really cool tradition as far as the dance and the customs go. And it was a Catholic tradition, um, which is a little bit awkward again because we don't worship the saints or and we don't worship like the different images of Christ that the Catholic Church worships. But as far as respecting their culture and acknowledging that this is something that they've put into their culture and their tradition, especially in that area, it was a really cool experience to see. And you'll see things like that anywhere in Peru. Like in the jungles, they've got some dance traditions, of course, too. Um, in the jungles, you also find the indigenous uh, tribal people's traditions, which is really cool to see as well. 
And there's a lot of things like that, honestly, just everywhere you go. And it's it's a really cool tradition to participate in as far as our culture is. We didn't well, we didn't really participate in it, I should say, but to see, to get to be a part of, to see watch it. When you get to Peru, you will see a lot of Catholic traditions because Peru has been primarily Catholic, as a lot of other South American countries. So you will see a lot of Catholic traditions when you get down there. Like you'll see the the celebrations for the saints, a lot of things like that. And some of them you might kind of kind of look at, especially as members of the church, we might look at it that kind of cut like a. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, but and, and maybe we're not in agreement with what they do, but that's one of the things that when you go there, you have to learn how to respect because it means a lot to a lot of people down there. Um, it even actually means a bit to some of the members who are still new and who are still adjusting to the idea that, well, we don't really worship saints, we, we worship Jesus Christ. And that's one of the things you will have to deal with as you get there, as far as the culture goes and traditions. The music in Peru is really good. You will find a lot of really good kinds of music, and they've got a lot of different Latin uh, genres there that you'll also hear. Um, on the radio, of course, they'll, they'll pull music from the States. You'll hear English music. You'll hear Spanish music. You'll hear things like that. But if you go for the traditional musics from Peru itself, um, the, the ones that I enjoyed most, at least, would be like cumbia, which is kind of a nice, kind of fast-paced dance music, which is more honestly of just Latin in general. But they've got their, their kind of cumbia there in uh, Peru. As for something that's very specific to Peru, and I will warn you, you have to be very careful with this music. It's called Wino. And for me, I personally don't like it, <laughs> uh, being completely honest. Um, it, it's kind of, it's a very repetitive music that they, that they do, um, and they'll do dances to it too. Um, I saw it, I heard it many times when we passed by uh, celebrations of people in the streets. Um, but it is, it is extremely repetitive. And they also will sing it in a manner that's kind of pitchy, I will say. They're, they're kind of going up and down and up and down and up and down. And you're kind of sitting there going, okay, okay. Trying to be open-minded, okay. Um, what, what really did me in for this one was one time my companion and I, we were uh, heading to a, a leadership conference with all the zone leaders and the sister leaders in the mission. And we got on this bus that went from Cerro de Pasco to Huancayo that took about six hours. And the entire drive, this was all they were playing, it was just this music, just constantly. And then what made it worse was they had this food called tokush, which is these potatoes that they let rot for six months in water. Then they dry it out and they'll make puddings and things out of it. It's, it's gross. That's one of the foods that's banned, thankfully, from our mission. Um, but... They had tons of it just on the bottom side of this bus. So we had that smell wafting up to us, mixed in with this repetitive why no music, which sounded a bit like shouting and a bit of um, yeah, shouting, I'll just say, in the music. And it was just by the end of those six hours, we were both just like this. Please make it stop. <laughs> Please make it stop. <laughs> so for both of us, we don't really have that high of an opinion of wino anymore, just because we, we had that experience. Um, they do have some wino that's good. I liked, uh, there's a few examples of wino that I would say, this is a really good example of what wino should be and what it would sound like. Um, if they all sang it like this, I would love it. It's, it can be a really good music. But because a lot of them will sing it in these other ways, and it just, it sounds a little bit dissonant and a little bit kind of just like a bit rushed and very repetitive, you might get kind of tired of it like I have. Um, that's the only music I would complain about in Peru, though. The rest of the music, honestly, is really good. I, I especially like listening to the music Andina, which isn't just in Peru. That's in all of the Andes mountains, but they use the pan pipes and they'll use like the natural flutes. And a lot of those things are really cool to listen to, and I really enjoyed those. Let me explain one of the classic dishes for Peru. It's called lomo saltado. It's, I'm not sure where exactly it originated in Peru, but it's basically a stir fry that they make with nice strips of beef. Uh, they, they throw in uh, like bell peppers, onions, a bunch of other things, regular peppers as well, to give it this nice, slightly spicy flavor, but just really good. Uh, it's cooked also with a bit of soy sauce, um, a few other things. And then what they do is they take this delicious mixture of meat and soy sauce and salty goodness and they stick it on top of french fries, which is kind of weird, but because you wouldn't think they would do that because the dish is served with fr french fries, 
uh, rice, and then this stuff. And you'd think they'd put this stuff on top of the rice, but no, they put it on top of the french fries. <laughs> but it's, it's just honestly just this delicious flavor because it's a little bit spicy. Um, but the meat, the meat usually comes out good. The seasonings that they put in just make it awesome. And then mixed with the french fries, it's actually surprisingly good on top of the french fries, which I liked. And then the rice is honestly there because, quite frankly, Peruvians will eat rice with anything. Um, it's, it's a really good dish, honestly. It's one of my favorites. I also like the, uh, the version that they do where they, instead of throwing it up with rice and potatoes, they just put it on top of noodles. Tayarin saltado, they call it. And that's also really good. Um, Tayarin means noodles. So, let's see. So that's one of my favorite dishes. Um, I could tell you they have about a bazillion dishes that will be focused on some form or other of chicken, rice, and potatoes. And it's awesome if you really like chicken, rice, and potatoes, which I do. I especially like it now that I've been on the mission. But, um, for example, uh, pollo entomatado which is tomato chicken. <laughs> it's kind of a fun name. It's, it's this sauce with tomatoes that they, they mix with the chicken and then they'll serve that with rice and then they'll just boil some potatoes, make them into slices and put them to the side and boom, there's the dish. And it's just like, yeah, yeah. For your, at first you look at it and you go, huh, this looks kind of simple. And then you try it and you're just like, ah, so good, <laughs> so good. Um, one of the cool dishes, this is a special dish which they make, it's called pachamanca. That's a word in Quechua, which is one of the, the language that you can learn in the South, and which you will also hear in Wonkayo itself. Pachamanca is, is translated effectively to dirt chicken. <laughs> what it is, is um, it's kind of like how they would do cook the uh, giant pig in Hawaii with the stones buried in the earth. They will do something like that, but they'll do it with chicken. So they, and they also do it with pork and different things, but one of the primary things is chicken. Um, they take and they heat up stones in a fire, they get some good stones, uh, they prepare a hole, they line the hole with the stones afterwards, and then they, they pour in just tons of potatoes, put a layer of potatoes, then like a layer of corn, maybe a layer of lima beans, which they eat surprisingly quite a bit of lima beans down there, which surprised the crud out of me. Um, lima beans, and then they'll put the meat in there, and they'll be putting like uh, between each layer more stones, more things to keep it warm, to keep it cooking. Then they cover that with a tarp and bury it. And they just let it sit there for, for like, I don't remember how long it is. I think maybe an hour, two hours or so. They let it sit there for a while because it is a special dish. And then when it's all done cooking, they, they uncover it. They take the tarp off and they pull all the meat out of the hole. They pull all the potatoes out of the hole, all this stuff. And then they just put different parts of it onto a plate for you. Put your piece of meat there, which has just been seasoned in just such a really cool way. And you eat it, and it's it's not too dry, but it's not really moist. It's not like liquid in there, but it's just got this nice, like, I would call it dirt flavor. <laughs> it's kind of a hard flavor to explain, but it's, it's so good. It's just, it's delicious. And they only really try to make it on special occasions or, like, if, if they've got something really special going on. Uh, in Wonkayo, there's, there's a um, celebration in August, which is called Santiago. It's kind of a celebration for one of the Catholic saints. But during this celebration, they will make tons of pachamanca. It will just be coming out of the earth, just here, there, everywhere. It's, and, and you kind of just go like, this is awesome, because it's everywhere. Then you can go to the restaurants and you get it, and you, it's, it's just really good food, honestly. Um, let's see, another thing that's really good, this one's, this one's really common, this one's called pollo a la brasa. What it is, it's kind of like a spit roasted chicken over coals, which they also season really good. And then they, they cut it into four pieces, so you get a quarter piece of a chicken right on your plate. Bunch of french fries right on the other side of the plate. And then they'll usually serve it with like this little salad, but honestly the salad doesn't have any flavor, so I don't really care so much about the salad. That in my mission, we were actually um, banned to eat a few foods, which I can go over in just a minute. One of them, though, was lettuce. So we couldn't eat the salads anyways. Um, so we would usually just ask for more french fries. <laughs> but that one was really good. And what I would usually do there is I would just cover with everything with ketchup, with mayonnaise. They have a special mayonnaise down there called casera, which is made with a bit of lime and a bit of salt and a bit of other seasoning. It tastes a lot better than regular mayonnaise. So... 
you can just put some of that on there and it's also really good. And then I also used uh, some of the spicy cream sauces that they make. A lot of the, the sauces that they'll make down there, a lot of them will be kind of homemade. Um, if you go to restaurants, you will also end up eating watered down ketchup. It's just going to happen. <laughs> they don't have tons of money, so they'll, they'll try to cut corners where they can. <laughs> But you, you kind of just go, okay, that's fine, whatever, and you just eat it anyways with a lot of salt. Um, but that's how I would eat it anyways, and I thought it was great. And in some restaurants, I would also put um, what was called crema de acetuna, which is basically olive sauce. It's, it's basically they ground up olives and mayonnaise. <laughs> but it tastes really good, so... Um, so that's, that's a lot of the good tasting foods as far as I liked. And there's a lot of other ones, like you could look up... Um, Shoot, the names are avoiding me. Seco de pollo is really good. It's kind of this green, nice stuff. Arroz con pollo is, is a classic dish, which you'll find almost everywhere. But in Peru, of course, they have their own style of doing it. You have papaloan caina, which is they take boiled potatoes, they slice them up on a dish, and they cover them with this sauce, which they make with cheese, uh, peppers, and some other creams and a few other things like that. Sometimes I'll also throw in bread to make it a bit thicker and a bit more creamy as far as they're concerned. And that one's also really good. It's a white cheese too, so the, the orange flavor does not actually come from the cheese, it comes from the peppers that they throw in. But that one's really good, and that one's a classic. It's a little weird though, they serve it cold. So you, you sit here and you think, oh man, my potatoes are cold, why are my potatoes cold? It's because they're supposed to be cold. <laughs> So you got to get a bit used to that. They've got something called a hide gallina, which is also really good. Um, if yeah, I would just recommend looking up a lot of these things because as far as time goes, I probably won't be able to explain all of them, but they're really good dishes. Now, ask for weird dishes because I like weird dishes too. I will explain three weird dishes that I personally got to eat. The first one was called caldo de cabeza, which I like to call sheep head soup. <laughs> what they do is they, they actually go and they take a sheep's head just a dead sheep head, nice, like that. And they, they'll usually cut it into four, boil it, and start throwing in a bunch of herbs, a bunch of other vegetables, a bunch of other things into the soup, usually rice also. And then they'll just serve you that. And you'll get this nice little quarter chunk of a sheep's head in your soup, which you're kind of just staring at like, is that, is that supposed to be there? <laughs> But it, eating it actually wasn't too bad. Um, they they will not feed you the eyeballs. Don't worry about that. Yeah, I asked uh, twice to my pension because we had pensions who cooked for us everything. Uh, I asked the sister, I asked her, um, do I eat the eyeballs? And she goes, no, that's disgusting. Why would you eat the eyeballs? And I was just like, yes. <laughs> but you will eat the tongue. You will have to eat the meat on it. Um, they, they do have like a bit of meat behind in the eye sockets and, and other things and I like how I reference my own eye for that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but um, just basically scraping what meat you can off of it. When I ate it, I ate it um, in a soup that was called uh, patasca, which is a soup made from corn, boiled corn, which then you have to add the salt and everything afterwards because if you added it while it's boiling, it won't explode like they want it to. The corn explodes while it's boiling. And she gave me the entire head when I was eating this because I actually I asked her to make it because I thought well I've got to have some kind of story when I get home about food so I asked her to buy me a head and she bought me the whole head put the whole head in my bowl and it had the skin on it it had the eyeballs in it it had everything on it and I kind of at first it was kind of like Ugh. but after I after I think my companion was more grossed out than I was, honestly. I've got a video of the entire process, and he's just sitting there the entire time going, eh! He was from Chile, and he didn't like the idea at all. Um, but I, 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 what I ended up doing was peeling the skin off, kind of putting it somewhere where I didn't have to look at it because it was gross. And I uh, just started eating the meat off the sheep's head, and it actually, with, with that part, it wasn't too bad. Tongue did not taste as bad as I thought it would. Or did it, it didn't feel weird, like I thought it'd be chewy and kind of gross. And it tasted like meat, and it felt like meat in the mouth, and it was just like meat. And I thought, well, that's weird. It looks gross. It's white. I don't know why it's white. But I eat it, and it tastes like meat, and it feels like meat. It's meat. Awesome. <laughs> and it actually tasted pretty good. And I did eat quite a bit of the meat off the thing. I don't think I finished it, though. Um, she ended up, I believe, giving the rest of the head to her dogs. 
but uh, when I was eating it, it was, it was kind of weird how it actually tasted okay. So if you do get sheep's head soup, don't worry, it's not as creepy as it sounds, except for the fact that you have a sheep's head in your soup. Next thing that was weird that I ate, I ate grubs. And this one, I did actually go out of my way to eat them. Grubs are more exclusive to the jungle. So if you go, for example, to Mission Iquitos, which is just the North Pure Jungle, you're going to eat grubs. It's, it's going to happen. Uh, in my mission, you probably won't actually have to eat grubs unless you seek them out. And it might be hard to get a hold of them. But what I did was basically, I was serving in Wanaco, and within my zone, the north part of my zone, there was a place called Tingo Maria, and that's just pure jungle right there. That's just deep jungle, which is kind of weird that it's so close. Um, but in Tingo Maria, the elders, their pension, she had family who actually lived in Pucalpa, which is in Mission Iquitos. It's deep, deep jungle. And they would send her the grubs because for their family, the grubs were a delicacy. And the, the elders mentioned it to me one time and I said, oh, that'd be kind of cool to try. And they said, okay. And then I didn't hear anything about it for like two weeks. And then two weeks later, I suddenly get this call while we're getting ready to take care of some stuff from the elders. Oh, the Cody, we sent you your grubs. Go get them. <laughs> What? <laughs> yeah, go get the grubs. Okay. So I went, I got the grubs. They'd sent me five grubs, including this ridiculously huge, juicy one. And I didn't know what to do with them. So we took them to my pension, and my pension was a very health conscious person, and she did not like grubs. She did not like the idea of how they eat in the jungle. She was kind of cool that way, kind of very sarcastic kind of dry humor lady and so we bring these gr grubs into her house and she kind of looks at him and she goes Ugh! you are not cooking that on my stove you're not cooking that with my stuff we convinced her eventually just let us cook it and she said okay fine but you're cleaning everything up we she ended up cleaning everything up anyways <laughs> kind of bad but we were grateful um, so we cooked it up. She actually helped us cook it a little bit. She soaked it in uh, some lime juice, some garlic, and some salt after we'd cut the heads off and cut the little grubs in half. That was so sad. I mean, they were alive and wriggling, and we killed them so we could fry them and eat them. <laughs> um, it's also kind of funny. She's uh, The pension there was the bishop's wife, and so the bishop was there, and he had a very similar thing, too. And uh, hey, He got home during this, and he's like, what are you guys eating? What's that smell? And we said... Grubs. We said Suri, and he goes, Elder, it's a worm. You're eating worms. <laughs> but as far as the flavor goes, I mean, they, it was kind of weird as we were cooking them because we, we threw them onto the, the, the pan, and it just sizzled this sound that was even greater than the sizzle of bacon because these things are just pure fat. These little grubs are just made of pure fat. So we threw it like right onto this pan, and it goes, Tss. It was just so beautiful, that sound, because it made me think of bacon. And then you remember, it's not bacon, and you're kind of like, oh. Anyways, so I ate them after that. I, I had my companion eat them. He'd already eaten something similar. He was from Ecuador, but he didn't really want to eat them <laughs> at that point. So he, he tried, like, one and said, okay, I'm good. Uh, we also had a uh, member who was had accompanied us during this moment. And he also tried them, and he was also kind of like, it's weird. I live so close to the jungle, and I've never tried these. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> but I think in the end, I ended up eating most of them just because uh, I don't want to waste the grubs. I, I, I mentioned them. I got them. So I ate them. And honestly, for me, it wasn't too bad. They, uh, after frying them, after cooking them, I mean, it, it felt kind of just like eating chicken fat, honestly. Maybe not the greatest experience, but it didn't taste bad. And it, it wasn't too bad of an experience. Uh, I would probably never eat them alive, though. <laughs> There are people who eat them alive, and I don't think I could do that. It would just be so gross. Let's see. The last weird thing I ate, and this is the classic thing that everybody would talk about from Peru, is guinea pig. I ate a guinea pig. And it was kind of sad. But from the start of my mission, everybody told me that they ate guinea pigs. And I was just like, that's sad. Why would you eat a guinea pig? Uh, but I, I got that curious thought of, well, but if, I, if, I, if they eat a guinea pig... And, and I've got this goal now of eating weird things after I ate the sheep's head. I, I had that goal of I'll eat weird things so that way I can keep talking about the weird things I ate. I've got to eat a guinea pig. Just got to do it. So I would always ask my pensions wherever I go. I would say, can we get a guinea pig? Can we cook some guinea pig? And they would always say, yes, but you have to kill it. And I couldn't do it. It was finally in my last area of the mission that I finally 
talked with one of my pensions and convinced her to just get the guinea pig dead already and just cook it. Which they also warned me, if the guinea pig has a tail, it's not a guinea pig. Don't eat it. <laughs> so, note for all you people watching this who are going to go to Peru, if the guinea pig has a tail, it's not a guinea pig. Don't eat it. <laughs> but she, she finally bought the guinea pig, just prepared it for me, and I ate it, just a, like a small portion. And it tasted kind of like chicken. It was an older guinea pig, so it was a bit rough. And the thing about guinea pig is that because it's a rodent, it has a lot of skin. So if you don't like eating skin, you will not enjoy eating guinea pig. Uh, because the majority of it's skin, honestly. I mostly peeled that off and just ate what little meat was on the pork eye. But it didn't taste that bad. Um, I will probably be forever condemned by my niece now for having eaten something so cute. <laughs> Plus, plus, once you get, actually, you can say that I didn't mind eating guinea pig, the taste of the meat was okay, then you can just go and start freaking people out by saying, Yo, you got guinea pigs, mmm, mmm, tasty. And they're just like, how dare you, how could you, you are evil. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, just, it's a really funny experience once you actually do that, but as far as flavor and as far as texture goes, it's just like eating meat. Uh, it's just not as much meat, and it's not that bad. So if you want to try something a little bit out there that you probably wouldn't have ever thought of eating before, especially because it's a pet here, uh, guinea pig there is a delicacy, and you will never see guinea pigs there as just pets. There, There is always guinea pigs there with the intention of eating them. So just remember that. If you see something that you see is cute, don't get attached to it. It's, it's going to be on the dinner plate later. <laughs> Um, that's that's most of the weird things. Uh, outside of that mission, there are places in Peru where they actually eat cat. I did never eat a cat. I'm happy I will, will never eat a cat, I hope. I hope. Um, they also will eat, like, rabbits, and they'll eat... Uh, some of them will eat snakes. Not very many. That one is another thing you'd probably have to seek after, kind of crazily like the grubs that I looked for, especially in our mission. Um, if you do meet a woman who in Wonkayo who says that she could get you a snake to eat it, don't do it. It, it costs way too much. <laughs> it's not something that I would, I would recommend ever. Um, if you do get somebody who just offers you to eat snake, that's fine. Um, I will also mention just real quick that if you end up in the jungle, the food there is going to be different than the food in the mountains. In the mountains, you will see a lot of potatoes with your rice and your chicken. You go to the jungle, bananas. You're going to see a lot of bananas and a lot of fruits and a lot of things like that, which is also wonderful. It's delicious, um, but it is different. So just remember that. Um, don't be freaked out by it. Fried bananas are actually really good. In well, Peruvian Spanish, it's... Uh, they, they will call it Castellano, Castilian. Uh, they consider it to be a very, like, slightly more pure than other places, but they've also just got tons of lingo, tons of what they call jerga that they'll throw in there. Um, for the most part, as far as pronunciation goes, um, what, you, what you could say is, for example, in Mexico, the Spanish in Mexico is kind of sing-songy. They'll be bouncing up and down a little bit. Uh, you go to Argentina and they speak Spanish with an Italian accent. You go to Peru and it's kind of just fairly straightforward. Um, you'll find that in the jungle they've got a slightly different accent. Um, there are places where they will switch the pronunciation of some of the letters, which is kind of weird. Um, in Huancayo, it was mostly just normal, just kind of sounded nice. They weren't too sing-songy. They were expressive, and you could hear that in their voices, but a lot of times they would just, you know, Hola, ¿qué tal? ¿Cómo estás? Uh, ¿Qué tal tu día? ¿Está bien? Amigo, qué chévere. Chévere. That's a word that you will use to there that's not used everywhere. It means cool, nice, awesome. They also use things like bacán. Um, jerga, though, as far as jerga goes, some of the most interesting jergas I've heard are, are lingo or just slang that they would use. Um, there's, there's a word for guard, which is, guard is, would normally be like guardia or... Um, I'm not sure the other words for it actually at the moment. <laughs> Don't remember. But that'd be like watchman, guard. But they like to steal things from English in Peru sometimes. Just just because of some of the association they've had in Peru with uh, English speakers, Spaniards, all that stuff. So they won't say guardia, they'll say watchman. And they put that little E in the middle of watch and man, watchman. And it's kind of like, wait, what? <laughs> That was something that was kind of interesting there. Um, they will also throw in uh, verbs or words from Quechua, so occasionally you will hear them saying things in Quechua as well, mixed in with their Spanish, because a lot of them will like that. Um, let's see, other words or phrases that were interesting. 
So it was funny when some guys would come up and say, Hey, brother! And you're like, wait, what? Yeah, brother! And that, that has become a word in Peru that is naturally accepted. Brother! Which it is just saying hermano, but it's it's English that's been Spang or Spanish. I, I don't know how to say that. Uh, in Spanish, we would say Españolizado. So it's Spanished, I guess. <laughs> Oye, brother, watchiman, things like that. Shorts, they will also call them chort. Just chort. And you're kind of like, what? <laughs> Why? <laughs> You know, and you go outside of that, and a lot of people won't say anything like that. Uh, one thing I will mention too, as far as the Peruvian Spanish goes, you got to be careful uh, recognizing which words they think are bad words, because there are words which, outside of Peru, and this is true with any Latin country that you would serve, and there are words outside of that country that are normal; they're completely acceptable, and you're just they they'll say them where whatever normal. You know that's cool. You go into into the, the another country, and there you say the same word, and they're like, "How could you say that? That's terrible. That's a horrible word. Why would you say that?" Um, as to what those words are, I won't go over that right now. Just one because I don't remember all of them, and two because I'd rather not repeat them. But just know that there are words that are not universally bad words. They're just bad words within the country where you're serving. And outside of that, they might just be normal. Um, other than that, you know, I mean, it's, it's kind of just got a lot of the same things that Spanish does, where just depending on where you're serving and where you're not serving. Inside of that country, like you'll go to some countries where they will use, uh, for example, words like boss or things like that. In Peru, they, they won't use those words. In Peru, they use tu, and tu is just normal. Um, as a missionary, you will have to use usted, which is the formal way of greeting people and talking with them. It's the formal word for you, instead of the word tu, and the conjugations for that word. But, for example, um, I've, I had some companions from other countries, which you also have to deal with companions from other countries who will come serve there as well. They will speak differently than the Peruvians will. <laughs> And you will work with them on that as much as you work with yourself. And you will learn also that, for example, your companion says both. What he's saying is two, usually. And it's just slight differences like that that you'll have to recognize. Crime and safety. Um, number one, always walk where it's light. Try not to walk in the dark, ever. Uh, just be careful when if you see someone who looks shifty or if looks a little bit uh, odd. Now, I mean, you don't, don't immediately assume that they're a bad person and that you should avoid them completely, but just be careful. Uh, avoid the drunks, I would say. You will find a lot of drunk people in one Kyle. Just because, again, you, you find drunks everywhere, I believe. It's sad, it's, but it's true. You will find them. They are... They can be kind of annoying, kind of insistent. You feel bad for them, but at the same time, you feel kind of like, you know, leave me alone a little bit, and I will admit. It's a, it's a sad feeling to have to deal with, but it is something you will have to deal with. Don't give them money. Do not give drunk people money if they come up asking you for money. They're just a lot of them will actually just end up using it to go buy more beer and more alcohol, and it's just bad. You don't give your money to anybody. And don't let them know how much money you've got, and don't bring all of your money with you at any given day. If you're, if you, for example, you get a, a personal fund. We got a personal fund of eighty-seven souls, right? And we also got all the money at the beginning of the month to pay off the pension, to pay off our uh, rent, to pay off everything. You get that money, you take it back to your apartment, you get it ready, you don't take it out until you're going to go straight to pay it. Because if you take it out and you just have it with you, and someone does end up robbing you, you lose a lot of money. You know, because we're not going to, we're, we're honestly, as far as the mission handbook is concerned, and as far as the mission rules are concerned, you get robbed, you get robbed. You, you don't fight back, you, you try not to cause any problems, because you are a lot more important than money, or cameras, or whatever you've got. You are a lot more important than that, don't risk yourself. Um, just just take note uh, that you, you do keep your money safe. You don't take it out unless you're going straight to pay it or use it. Your personal fund, I would highly suggest that you take some of it with you and you leave some of it in your apartment. That way if you do get robbed, you won't lose all the money that you have and you'll still have something to get a hold of someone to take care of any needs that you've got. I would also mention, uh, recommend the same thing with your, your passage money, your, your travel money. That you just take a small bit of it with you they they sell little wallets there, little coin purses. You can grab one of those. There's ones for the belt. Just take some of the, the change with you. 
um, go out, use that for the day, and then you don't have to worry about really losing a lot if you do get robbed. Uh, cameras, I would suggest, I didn't do this very well, and I actually got my camera robbed while I was on the mission. I didn't even know it was gone until later, which was the worst part. If you're going to bring your cameras with you, keep an eye on them. Um, usually I would only suggest take them out on P days if you're going to use them or maybe ask for permission to take them out on baptisms. Usually they'll say okay to that. If you're carrying them around with you every day though, you have no guarantee that you're one that it's going to be safe. If you do get robbed, they will probably take the camera. And lastly, the camera can be very distracting in the first place and it can break and a lot of other things like that. I just take care of that if you're going to risk your camera like that, you know what risks you're taking. Um, let's see, other safety things I could say. Um, I would also just recommend follow the mission rules as best as you can. Don't leave your companion. Do not go separate into different rooms. Don't even think that that's an okay thing to do. This is, this is more spiritual safety as well as physical safety because a lot of problems could happen like that. If you do get separated from your companion, um, actually that's a really good thought. My suggestion for getting separated from your companion is get a hold of your district leader or your zone leader, get a hold of someone as quickly as you can. Probably try, I would say just wait where you are, get a hold of them, find a phone, stay there until someone comes to get you and don't move. <laughs> stay safe. Stay, stay there, stay safe. <laughs> Other things I would say, just seriously, just don't give money to people. Don't, don't take tons of things out with you. Just be kind of sparse, be kind of safe with, as far as that goes. That, that's my big thing with safety in one Kyle. You really, you probably won't have much problems. I honestly, I only got robbed the one time and they only took my camera and I honestly didn't even notice it was gone. So I didn't get held at gunpoint, knife point, nothing like that. Um, some people have just, just don't freak out. Trust in God that it's going to be okay and be prepared for that situation. Don't, don't be taking all things that are worth like a lot to you or all your money out. Oh, and lock your doors. Make sure your doors are locked when you leave the room. If you leave it unlocked, that's, that's your, that's your chance. That's your risk. Just leave it locked. Don't, don't let anybody in there. So you, you got your call to the mission, Peru Juan Kyle. Uh, congratulations on that. It's a really excellent mission. I had the, um, the amazing opportunity to be there to help open that mission. Um, I'm going to tell you right now that what you're going to do right now is the Lord's work. You have been called as a representative of Jesus Christ in one Kyle, and you are going to have this great opportunity to participate in the salvation of the souls of the people there. These are, this is a wonderful people. These are children of God. And I can testify that this work is a true work that you will be doing. Jesus Christ is our Savior, and He is their Savior as well. And it is our responsibility as missionaries and as representatives of Jesus Christ to take His word to them. And I testify that as we do so worthily, following the rules, being obedient, and remembering why we're there, these people's lives will be touched as our lives will be touched by the Holy Spirit. And both of us will come out with stronger conversion, a stronger testimony. I had the great chance to feel a lot, a lot different than I did before the, I went on my mission. I felt the spirit in my mission and I felt that converting power working both within the people who I was teaching and within myself. One of the greatest experience I had was the opportunity to baptize someone who was willing to give everything away for the gospel. And it was a moment when I actually got to think about if I was willing to give away everything for, for the gospel. This was a person who did not have much. It was this young Peruvian woman who was suffering through many different things that I honestly don't think I could have done. And yet she was willing to give up everything she had to follow Jesus Christ. I promise you that as you serve worthily, you will get to ch the chance to see people's lives changed like this. And you will get the chance to serve in this beautiful city of Huancayo and be able to make a difference and watch as the kingdom of God grows. It is... It is... A chosen place. It is holy, a holy place. And these are a chosen people. And I promise that this work is perhaps the greatest work you will be doing. And these things I testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.